Welcome to the module on basic electronics and electrical circuits. In this module, we will talk about the concept of electricity, concept of voltage, current, and resistance. We'll talk about Ohm's law, which is a law that gives you a relationship between the voltage, current, and resistance. We will also discuss series and parallel circuits. We'll extend this to look at a combination of series and parallel circuits. And finally, we'll also discuss a few basic electronics components like diodes, capacitors, and transistors. So let's start our discussion by talking about the concept of electricity. So the first question is, what is electricity? Now, none of us have seen electricity. You may have seen lightning. But what if I told you that you could actually taste electricity? If you have a 9 volt battery, the kind of battery that you find in many devices used at home, like smoke detectors or garage door opener or something similar, you can actually take that 9 volt battery. And I would say that at this point, maybe you can pause the video and take out the 9 volt battery wherever you may find it. Uh, make sure there's a charge battery. Um, taste it, put it on your tongue, both the terminals, uh, see what you feel. I assure you, nothing bad would happen to you if you do that. Uh, so go ahead and try that, and I won't tell you what exactly would you experience, but you will know. Uh, you will know the experience of tasting electricity when you do that. So we will start our discussion by looking at the structure of an atom. So let's say we have an atom, as shown over here, and we know that atoms have a few fundamental particles. You have the nucleus. And the nucleus contains protons and neutrons. We also know that the neutrons are positively charged particles, while neutrons have no charge. We, we call them neutral particles. And protons and neutrons are bound together in the nucleus via what we call a strong nuclear force. And it takes a lot of force to actually break them apart. Surrounding the nucleus, you have electrons that are orbiting in different shells. And electrons are negatively charged particles and they are bound to the atom via the electric electrostatic force of attraction between the positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons. So that's your basic structure of atoms. Pretty much everything in the world is made of atoms. We also know that there are 113 chemical elements, 113 chemical elements in the universe that make up observable matter in the universe. So when I say observable, that means that uh, the matter that can be observed. And it is said that there is only 4% of the matter in the universe that's actually observable. 96% is what is known as dark matter, something that we have no idea as to what it is you know, made of. Uh, for the purpose of this discussion, we will classify some of our chemical elements as conductors and as insulators. So we'll focus on those two classes of materials. So the conductors are kinds of materials where the electrons that are in the outer shell of the atom can be lost easily under the influence of an external force. So, so for example, metals like uh, silver, uh, gold, aluminum, copper, iron, these are all examples of the metals where the, the electrons in the outer shells and the outer orbits can be easily removed from the atom and uh, we call them as conductors because electrons become the carriers of the electricity in that case. Uh, insulators on the other hand are kind of the material like air, plastic and so on which do not lose their electrons from the outer shell so easily even if there's an external force applied on them. So electrons in the conductors become the carriers of the charge and we say that the flow of the electrons in the conductors 
is responsible for conducting electricity. So the flow of electrons, let me write that, flow of electrons in conductors gives rise to electricity. Now keep in mind that um, electrons which are negatively charged particles uh, give rise to electricity in conductors but there are other kinds of elements like a semiconductor material, semiconductor materials, the kind of material from which most of the integrated circuit and the chips are designed from, have also both positive and negatively charged particles, negatively charged particles which are responsible for flow of electricity. So this is negatively charged particles. So to harness the power of electrons, we have given rise to a device called battery. So the batteries are the kinds of devices that can give us a steady supply of electrons, which in turn leads to a steady supply of current. And so we'll discuss the concept of battery while in examples. We'll talk about a very popular primary cell called galvanic cell. So a galvanic cell employs basically two electrodes of two different materials dipped into electrolyte solution. So let's say we have a container and inside this container I have an electrode made of a material called zinc. Okay, And this is dipped inside an electrolyte solution which is basically an aqueous solution of zinc ion and let's say sulfate ion. Okay. So you have an aqueous solution of zinc ion and, and sulfate ion, which you would have because the zinc electrode over here, the zinc electrode will basically be oxidized when it is dipped into this kind of solution. So the oxidation reaction is that zinc is converted into zinc ion and two electrons. So when it does so, the, the zinc ion go into the solution and the electrons are left at the electrons are left at the electrode itself. Now you can also have another container and dip another electrode of a different material and we'll choose copper in this case. So this is a copper zinc galvanic cell. So let me write this copper zinc galvanic cell and this is also dipped in an aqueous solution which contains copper ion and sulfate ion. Okay so you have the aqueous solution of uh, copper ion and sulfate ion. Now copper also wants to give up copper ion and release two electrons. So you have copper ion now as a result inside the aqueous solution. Okay. Now, as the reaction continues in each of these two containers, you have the zinc ions that are getting into the solution in case of uh, container one. So let's call it, you know, container one and you have copper ions being released in, con in container two. Now, the electrons are depositing on the electrode, on the zinc electrode as well as copper electrode, and this reaction would stop after a while because there will be a lot of electrons, a lot of electrons on the zinc electrode, and there will be a lot of zinc ions, positively charged ions inside the solution, and the two would remain, would want to remain close to each other, okay, which means that the zinc would no longer turn into the zinc ion and go into the aqueous solution, and similar thing would happen over here as well in container number two. So now after a while you have an abundance of electrons on the zinc electrode okay and they have nowhere to go but now if let's say you connect the zinc electrode and the copper electrode via some sort of conducting wire okay made of some sort of metal now electrons have found a path to travel from the zinc electrode to the copper electrode. Now copper, copper uh, wants to give up copper ion as well as electrons but copper also has a stronger tendency to accept the electrons back and turn into the solid copper. So copper ion that is in the aqueous solution over here wants to combine with the electrons that are coming from the zinc electrode and turn back into the copper. So what happens over here is that the copper ion wants to accept the two electrons coming and then turn into solid copper. So there is nothing here. So that's the solid copper. So let me write it as CUSS as copper ion. So these are the two halves cell reactions that are happening in each of those two, these two containers. So as much as zinc wants to give up the zinc ion and electrons, copper wants to accept the electrons back and turn into solid copper. 
Now this reaction can sort of continue um, for a while, okay? What is going to happen after a while is that more and more electrons will be coming out of the zinc electrode, okay? And more and more zinc ion would be released in the aqueous solution in the container one, okay? But after a while, this reaction will stop because the zinc ion, the, po the, pos the abundance of zinc ion would, would prevent the negatively charged electrons to leave from the zinc electrode. It wouldn't want them to leave. Similarly, as more and more copper ions are converting into the solid copper in the, con in the uh, second container, this aqueous solution in the second container is turning into a negatively charged solution, which means it's going to repel the electrons that are arriving on the copper electrodes, which means that after a while, this reaction is more or less going to stop. To make sure that this reaction continues, we have to make sure that the aqueous solution in both container one and container two remains neutral. So to make that work, we have devised something called a salt bridge. So what you do is you create a bridge, essentially think of it as some sort of pipe, and inside this pipe you have some salt solution filled in. So something let's say called sodium uh, chloride. Okay, so you have sodium chloride salt solution inside this. And sodium chloride solution, of course, um, is going to be ionized. So you'll have sodium ions and you'll have chlorine ion, of course, everywhere. So what is going to happen is that chlorine ion that you have in the salt bridge will want to combine with the zinc ion that is in the aqueous solution. So zinc ion would want to combine with the chlorine ion and the sulfate ion that you have in here in the aqueous solution container two would want to combine with the positive sodium ion and that would help neutralize the charge of the aqueous solution in both container one and container two. So this reaction will continue until a few things happen. One is that there's no more sodium ion and chlorine ion left in the salt bridge, which means that after a while, the aqueous solutions will no longer be neutral in charge, or that the zinc is combining with the oxygen and forming a layer of zinc oxide on the, on the uh, zinc electrode, or that copper electrode is getting plated with more and more solid copper on it, right? So in one of those three situations, or more than one of those situations, the reaction is going to stop. So now the question is, what is the driving force over here? Okay, so if, can we provide a quantification for the driving force for the electrons to travel from the zinc electrode to the copper electrode, right? So first of all, we should notice that the zinc electrode is clearly going to be a negatively charged electrode because you have an abundance of electrons on the zinc electrode. We call this electrode to be anode, and that's a technical term for a negatively charged electrode. And the, and the copper electrode, which is positively charged, is called cathode, okay? So anode is negatively charged and cathode is positively charged electrode. Okay, so let's quantify the difference between the charge on the two electrodes. So to, to get that, we have to see that this is what we call an oxidation re reaction, oxidation reaction. So oxidation is where you give up the electrons, and this one is a reduction reaction, and reduction is basically when you accept an electron, okay? And with each of these two reactions, there is an associated electrical potential, what we call a standard electrical potential at a standard uh, environmental parameters, like, you know, standard temperature, standard pressure, and so on. So from your chemistry classes, you may have learned that the electrical potential for this reaction is... 0.34 let me say plus 0.34 volt and i'll define what volt is okay but this is basically a measure of electrical potential so it tells you something about how fast this chemical reaction can occur or what the strength what is the strength of this chemical reaction similarly for the zinc you have reduction of the zinc and that reaction you have two zinc ion plus two electrons converted into solid zinc, and the electrical potential for that is minus 0.76 volt. Okay, notice that this is reduction, but on the here over here we actually have an oxidation reaction. So if you want to get the opposite side electrical potential, this will become plus 0.676 volt. Okay, so now if you combine these two reactions, if you combine these two half reactions, what do we get? We get zinc plus two copper ion. Okay. Con converted into zinc ion plus solid copper, okay? And the associated, associated 
electrical potential for this reaction would be a combination of these two so that would be 0.34 plus 0.76 volt which is equal to 1.1 volt so that's your sort of a driving force for driving the electrons from the anode to the cathode so the larger this potential difference is larger the driving force is to move the electrons from anode to cathode so if you have ever wondered as to how we determine the voltage of a particular kind of, kind of battery, now you know the answer. All you have to do is find out what the internal chemistry of that battery is. So for example, most of the alkaline batteries, most of the alkaline batteries, so alkaline batteries are your typical AA, AAA, or, or even 9 volt uh, or C or D volt batteries that you obtain, that you can buy in, in, the, in the stores. Uh, and they're called alkaline because the electrolyte solution is an alkaline solution, something like potassium hydroxide, which is a pH much more than 7. And that's different from acidic uh, electrolyte chemistry batteries. Uh, okay, so the alkaline batteries are you know, much more popular nowadays. Uh, so, for example, if you look at AA alkaline battery, they have a zinc and magnesium dioxide uh, electrodes, electrode chemistry. So, zinc is one of the electrodes and magnesium dioxide is another electrode. So, if you can find the standard electrical potential of the two electrodes you can actually add them together to find out what the voltage would be so for a standard alkaline AA battery it could be anything from 1.5 to 1.59 you know, volt and that's determined by the by the chemistry of it uh, similarly if you look at the lead acid battery so lead acid battery so the lead acid batteries have lead and lead uh, dioxide as two electrodes and you can find out what their um, voltage would be by looking at the electrical standard electrical potential of the lead and lead dioxide. So if let's say that's 2 volt then for each cell so for each cell each cell being basically a pair of electrode you get 2 volt and if you want to get a 12 volt lead acid battery the kind that you might employ in in, in a car or uh, in a scooter then you would basically take six cells so you take six cells connected in series of each of 2 volt to get basically you know 12 volt.